So for the primary loading, we would get, depending on whatever method that we chose, we would find that the deflection here, delta at B for the primary loading is going to be a negative result. And, you know, I just used a chart value and it's going to be negative WL to the fourth over 8EI. And when I plug and chug into this thing right here, I would get, and this gives me a result of negative 156.25 over EI. Those are properties, geometric and material properties that will have numbers to it. Kilonewton meter cubed. And EI has units of kilonewton meter squared. So if I, you know, based on the units canceling out and things, I should get, if I had numbers for E and I, I would have uh, units of meters in this for this calculation. So that's delta B zero. Deflection at B for the primary loading. And then I would go ahead and do the same for the redundant loading. And again, using my appendix in the back of the book or wherever you have deflection equations for delta B1, I would get here that this is BYL cubed over 3EI. And it's positive because the beam is going upwards at this point from its original position. And this is, I could rewrite this, and this is BY times 41.67 meters cubed over EI. And basically we're just finding the deflection B here as a function of BY. So in a way we're doing it symbolically. Now I, I want you to notice something here and we'll expand a little bit. You'll notice how the format of delta B1, and we'll spend a little bit, of, a, a few minutes just examining delta B1. If I take this and I just kind of separate out some of the variables. So look at how this has kind of an analogy to a spring in that right here, I can do like a force. This is something you probably know. Force is equal to the spring constant or a stiffness coefficient times delta for the displacement. If I rearrange it, it will look like my displacement relationship at B for the redundant loading here. This delta is equal to the force times one over K. All right. And this right here, this inverse of this stiffness coefficient, we call this a flexibility coefficient. There's like a cursive F that we use, and I might just say it's, you know, it's equal to one over K, but it's got this analogy. And you know, if I look at the units of this stiffness coefficient, you know from basic physics that the units of the stiffness coefficient in units of force over length right here, which, you know, things like Newton per meter or pounds per inch like that, right? The way that this is explained is would be, it's like this is a, it denotes the force per unit length or per length. And so similarly, the flexibility coefficient F has units of length over force, which is the same as something like meter per Newton or inch per pound. And this, the flexibility coefficient, basically indicate displacement per unit force. I have basically a displacement per pound or per force. And, and really, this flexibility coefficient also, another way to look is if I have a cantilever beam, it's a coefficient that represents kind of the spring action of a cantilever beam that might have a unit force here of one, one pound, one newton, one kilonewton, whatever, okay? One has a unit force here, and it relates to the response that we would expect per the displacement response right here, this displacement response due to this unit force based on the length that we choose here and the materials that are involved with this here, this length and this EI of the of the member and how it's supported at the end. This flexibility coefficient gives us a sense of like, oh, what's it like as a spring or in any case, long story short is that this L cubed over three EI is like a spring coefficient. And it's basically an analogy saying that, oh, what's the equivalent spring of this cantilever or the spring stiffness coefficient of this cantilever beam? All right. And what we could do, and the reason I'm talking about this, so I can rewrite my compatibility equation as this, this would be zero equals this delta B zero for the primary loading is a known number, if you will. And this right here, this delta B1, which was in solved in terms of BY back here, right here, I can rewrite this. This BY is this L cubed over 3EI. And instead of doing this L cubed over 3EI, I could write this as delta B0 plus BY times 
like FBB. And this FBB, what that means is for this point right here, if this is point B, FBB, this would be the displacement at B due to a unit force at B. Yeah, all right. If I can break up my statically indeterminate structure into a set of like known, well-analyzed, statically determinate structures, then I can probably look up a table of these flexibility coefficients and assemble my compatibility equations relatively quickly without having to do basically a shortcut from doing all those displacement calculations using whatever method you want to use. So here, this would be this. And if I had more than one redundant reaction, then shoot. I would need, I would have two compatibility equations, and really what it, this whole thing alludes to is a matrix formulation, especially when we have two or more redundant reactions. Now, I would probably cap it at three, you know, because inverting, you got to do an, a matrix inversion later, but like this matrix inversion, if you're going to do things by hand, a three by three is about as good as you can get, okay, by hand. Now, do you need to know all this to solve this problem? No, you don't, right? But, you know, it's just good to know, especially if you're going to move further into the world of structural analysis, and especially later on, if you're taking a structural analysis course, you know what I'm saying? You got, there, there's going to, you're going to eventually learn about matrix structural analysis. And that's where, you know, things lead after a first course in structural analysis. So we have the deflections here. We have, we've got this delta B0 and this for delta B1 right here. And so now we just plug that back into our compatibility equation and solve for that unknown BY. So now I plugged and chugged, and now I can solve, and you'll notice that, let's see, the EI, I can multiply through both sides of the equation by EI. Wow, how convenient. I can divide through by meters cubed, and all those units cancel out, so I should be left with units of kilonewtons. And when I solve for BY here, BY is positive 3.75 kilonewtons. And that positive just means that in the original drawing way back here, my free body diagram, that positive result means that this direct that I chose for BY, this pointing upwards is good, and that means the BY is 3.75 kilonewtons pointing upwards. And so we've got BY, yay! And so now that we have this, right, our number of unknowns is now reduced to three. We can solve for the remaining unknown reactions just using equilibrium equations and then draw the shear moment diagrams. So I'll bring down the original drawing here. And using equilibrium equations, I can go ahead and solve for the remaining support reactions for AX, AY, and the moment at A. And so let's see, from some of the forces in the horizontal, I would get AX is zero. Some of the forces in the vertical, I would get AY minus two kilonewtons per meter times five meters plus 3.75 kilonewtons. And this would tell me that AY is 6.25 kilonewtons. It's going to be a positive positive result indicating upwards and my if I take moments about a then I would get ma plus ma minus 2 kilonewton per meter times 5 meters that's the force resultant times the arm of 2.5 meters plus 3.75 kilonewton times 5 meters equals 0 and this would give me that ma is equal to, oh, plus 6.25 kilonewton meters. Hey, I didn't plan that to have the same magnitude. <laughs> Who knew? And this is 6.25 kilonewton meters. Uh, the positives just indicates that the direction that in which I drew the free body diagram is good. So it's going this way. That's all my support reactions. And if you know all your support reactions, guess what you can do? You can draw the shear moment diagrams. So drawing the shear moment diagrams, I won't explain too much here. I feel like all of you should know this, if you're, especially if you're working on like statically indeterminate structures, I bet you have some expertise now on drawing shear and moment diagram. And this one should probably be a piece of cake. So vertical lines at discontinuities, yes. And I have my shear diagram here. This will be in kilonewton meters. And my moment diagram. 
I have a constant loading or constant uniform distributed load. So my shear diagram is going to be linear. My moment diagram will be parabolic. And let's see, I go up to 6.25 kilonewtons and I will go down 10 kilonewtons because that's the area or the resultant of the distributed load. And that'll take me to negative 3.75. And now I just need to connect the dots. Yes. Yes, yes, yes. And this distance here, that for my moment diagram, this distance here to where the shear is zero. Yes, right here. If you're not sure, well, one way to do this is, you know, you know that the change in shear is 6.25. So that means the area at which this distributed load is 6.25. And so this would just be decreasing at a rate of two kilonewtons per meter. So this distance is 6.25 divided by two, which is 3.125 meters. And, and now I can draw the moment diagram. And my moment diagram is going to start at negative 6.25 here, right there. It's going to be parabolic where I have the zero shear. That's an interesting point for me because that's going to be a maximum here. Yes, and uh, let's see, the change is going to be the area under the shear diagram here, which is 1 half 6.25 times 3.125, and that area is equal to 3.52. Boom, I'm going to get right here, I'll get a max of 3.52 kilonewton meters, and my curve is parabolic. I know here I have a zero shear, so this is horizontal. Yay. And then here I have a positive slope of 6.125 like this. Yay. And therefore, I would have a graph that looks like. And then the remainder, this area right here, this area right here is also, it's going to be a negative one half. This distance is 5 minus 3.125, which is 1.875. Yes, time. 3.75. Uh, I guess the negative, I should put the negative on the negative 3.75. Ah, it's all good. It's going to get a negative area result, and that area is negative 3.52 kilonewton meters, which will take me down to zero. And my, the rest of my curve will look like this. Yes, and that is the moment diagram. So to recap, oh my gosh, we just solved this and went through a detailed explanation of everything. So this is what we did. You know, we took a statically indeterminate structure. We chose to use the force method. We broke it up into stable statically determinate part using the principle of superposition. We chose a redundant reaction. That was kind of an important part of that process. We wrote out the compatibility equations and then, you know, to relate these drawings together. Then we solve for displacements using methods that we had learned or the appendix of your textbook. Hopefully whatever is easier. And then you calculated unknown that unknown redundant reaction everything else was just solving and plugging and chugging solving for the remaining reactions using equilibrium equations and then drawing the normal shear and moment diagrams did you ever think it, when you were taking statics that calculating the e reactions and drawing normal shear and moment diagrams would be the easy part you're welcome all right take it easy let me know if you have any questions structure free